Anyway, uh, Jean, it is such a great pleasure to be talking with you. Um, and for those who don't know you, um, you're Jean Fried, and you're, you've been a water expert for many, many years. Could you give us just a little, a few words about your background in water, and particularly in groundwater? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, I started to be involved in groundwater indirectly because I was involved in uh, the morphological studies of porous media. When I came as, uh, for uh, my master at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, but then uh, to, to earn my living, uh, besides my uh, scholarship, uh, I worked at the Illinois State Water Survey and uh, with a gentleman whose name is uh, was he passed away Thomas Prickett, who was involved in groundwater for the state of Illinois, and then I started to do modeling. Actually, I was an applied mathematician at the beginning uh, when I graduated from France, and uh, so I worked first on analog models resistance capacitors and and immediately for the state water survey mathematical modeling of groundwater hydrodynamics actually uh, not long ago i visited uh, the illinois state water survey and in their museum they they keep my first analog uh, model they say it's really? a piece of yes it's a piece of history <laughs> okay what an honor Yes, well, uh, it makes it made me feel like a very old, uh, <laughs> a very old person. Okay, in any case, it was 1965, and uh, then I went on on the working, uh, not directly on groundwater, but on the mathematical modeling of diffusion dispersion of miscible fluids in porous media, and uh, I took the example of miscible pollution of groundwater and i've done that for uh, then for the rest of my life i have to say and teaching also mathematical modeling uh, so i am not a field uh, hydrologist or whatever i uh, i'm a theoretician and i worked really on modeling and then I, I then I, I changed because in 1976 I was asked to direct the task force of the European Union, the European Commission, actually the executive branch of the of the Union, to prepare the first, very first groundwater directive. Directive in EU jargon means law. The first groundwater directive of the EU which was adopted in 1980 and concerned groundwater quality only, not mm. quantity. So, so that this is uh, a, a little of my background. I will come back on that uh, if we speak of groundwater change during my career, or, or maybe you want to, that I, I, I speak of that right now. Sure. Okay, if you want. Uh, so, uh, I worked on the groundwater directive. So, I, I was not involved in mathematical modeling anymore, but really on the aspect relating legislation and science. Uh, legislation, policy, and science. As I was chairing the task force, uh, preparing that uh, directive. I have to say, which is, I think, quite interesting in terms of the meaning of the interest in groundwater, at least for the moment at EU level, it was not an ecological law. No? The, no. The people who asked for that law the policymakers we are not directly interesting interested in protecting the environment 
clearly. It was what I call an economic law. It was a law aiming at preventing the distortion of competition between member states. Why? Because some member states were already concerned with the environment, like Germany, for instance, France a little, England not at all. Uh, but of course, because of uh, reg regulations about uh, the protection of the environment, pollutant, polluters, polluting industries had to pay, of course, heavier taxes than the others, which means that created of course, a distortion of competition. And this was in some way to restore a just balance between the member states that that law was launched and finally adopted in 1980. But of course, with my colleagues at the European Commission, we were environmentalists, we were ecologists, although that term did not really exist at the time. So we were really concerned with the protection of water and of the environment of uh, wetlands, for instance, etc. So we started to, to work on the introduction of the environment in uh, EU preoccupations. It had been started a few years ago, but not in the domain of water. And we managed uh, in 1988 to organize what we call a ministerial seminar, that is a meeting of the m major political people involved in, uh, in uh, organizing, regulating, etc. The environment and water. It was in Frankfurt, 1988, and uh, the for the first time a water policy was defined. I was the secretary general of the ministerial meeting, so I chaired the task force. Uh, the minister signed. We worked in the shadow. And uh, and we uh, saw that we finally introduced environmental concern and ecological concerns in the water policy. And I'm guessing, can I ask a question? Uh, and I'm yeah. guessing that the focus was mostly on surface water and not groundwater because awareness had not yet been raised about groundwater. Would that be a correct assumption? Yeah, it was mainly, it was surface water, but with groundwater also, but more in the background. But finally, but finally it worked because in 2000, the European Union adopted the WFD, the Water Framework Directive, and for the first time, quality, quantity were introduced. Groundwater was fully introduced, and groundwater that was taken care of through that 1980 uh, Groundwater Directive on quality. Uh, but uh, it was, and in 2006, in 2006, the water directive as we call it uh, I, I say directive but i wish to insist that directive means a law that is compulsory at, uh, for all member states so the the daughter directive of 2006 was on groundwater so and uh, to clarify criteria for uh, for good chemical status and specification for reversal of pollution trends and prevent limit pollution so groundwater in 2006 and at the same time for instance in france a, a groundwater law was also adopted at that time 
although in France, uh, groundwater and water has been dealt with in 1964. Very early. Yeah, very early, especially very uh, interesting because it uh, introduced the management of water at basin level. That is not taking into account administrative boundaries, but hydrological boundaries, which was a very first. And introducing also part the public participation. So 1964, actually, I think it was fully in, in, uh, adopted in 1966. Uh, it took uh, two years to pass whatever but it is a 1964 law and then uh, it was modified improved etc but really public participation and uh, watershed and, and watershed uh, management the basin water basin management was introduced in 1964 with the uh, the French uh, territory divided up into six watersheds, watershed, uh, water basins, where the uh, which were uh, let's say independent in some way. The, the management was divided up into six uh, water basins, and since then it has been. Uh, propagated, it has been done worldwide. Mm. That was very forward looking. Yeah, so this is really uh, some aspects of my uh, uh, of my work. And at the same time, it is how I see uh, groundwater change uh, during my career. I know that you were interested. I have to add, Rene, that uh, now, although we think that groundwater is rather well studied, I gave the example of California. By the way, I wish to insist concerning California that it was, California was the last Western state, US state, to regulate, to regulate groundwater. And until now, until 2014 or 15, when it was really adopted, it was adopted in 2014 and started to be implemented uh, in 2000, beginning of 2015, uh, groundwater was managed on a voluntary basis. Now we have it being uh, implemented with the uh, help uh, through 500, I think 515 basins or sub-basins, so it's rather complicated, with the creation of uh, groundwater sustainable agencies. I think 260, something like that. I don't have the right figures now, but quite a, quite a number. And uh, the uh, for each one, a groundwater sustainability plan. That which is uh, just being implemented. That is, we have until 2040 or 42 to to have the uh, Act, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, Sigma, we call it Sigma, fully implemented. So we have another 20 years for the full implementation in California. So I insisted about the uh, that it was the last Western state to be uh, to regulate groundwater, and yet groundwater is extremely important in California, especially for agriculture for, and for urban uh, also for domestic use. Agriculture, of course, is really uh, I think the the the, the most important significant stakeholder but in the average about 40 percent for an average year 40 percent of california water is groundwater in dry years it goes up to 60 percent and 
what I've read, I, I did not compute that, but what I've read is about 85% of Californians rely on groundwater compared to 75% for the inhabitants of the European Union. So it's really very important. And yet, and this is where I come to say something I wanted to say, we still are in a out of sight, out of mind configuration for groundwater. We don't see it. It's obvious. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's it's underground. So we don't think of it. And groundwater, in spite, despite these regulations, these laws, some interest, is still rather unknown from the public, from the decision makers, but also many hydrologists don't know much about groundwater. Really? Yeah. Yeah. They are concerned with surface water. Surface water. And especially here in California, we it's a little different from now Europe. The relationship between surface water and groundwater are not yet fully uh, uh, I would say taken care of. Uh, you have uh, still surface water, water this surface water districts. You see, you have still organization uh, administrations which take care of surface water. Mm -hmm. So there's still the separation. It's yeah, not an no integrated, integration. yeah. No integration, which is not the case with the European Union legislation. Surface water and groundwater are more fully integrated and EIWRM is implemented, in integrated water resources management. It's more fully integrated. But yet, yet, people are, uh, are concerned, they, they are aware, of uh, such, uh, uh, I would say, a weakness in the uh, management. And for instance, uh, last year in 2019, I organized a workshop. Uh, I organized a workshop with a uh, uh, what we have here at the university, I belong to University of California, Irvine, where we have uh, what we call water UCI. And with the help of the California Department of Water Resources, uh, with also the um, State Water Board, which is actually the, the real name is State Water Resources Control Board. And the USGS, California Water Science Center, and the financial help of several water districts, including the water district where I live, Orange County Water District. We organized a quite interesting uh, semi, uh, not seminar, we called it uh, workshop, bringing to California several people from the European Union in order to exchange with various California stakeholders, not necessarily only uh, public representatives, but also from the, uh, I, I must say, from the population, people, uh, well, various type of stakeholders, public and private representatives also from the agriculture, of course. And we discussed, I have the, 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 the title here um, exactly, well, I, I wrote it, so I should remember it, but. You've written so many things, Jean. <laughs> 
hard to keep yeah. them all straight, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it is uh, sustainable groundwater management and conflict resolution. Mm. Uh, I brought uh, a colleague and friend from, from some time ago from UNESCO, who was in charge at UNESCO of the conflict resolution uh, program to organize a role play on conflict and conflict resolution, which had a great success. Maybe you know her, it's Lena Salame, who no, I don't. charge at UNESCO uh, oh, okay. of, of the program. Of, uh, and um, so it, it was quite a success. And we noticed that uh, uh, there were many similarities between the European Union and California in terms of uh, groundwater management. And that could be, so uh, comparison was useful. And uh, it was decided to follow up on that uh, workshop. And we, I am now in charge of preparing a, another workshop which will be uh, strengthening California's groundwater resilience, governance, economics, and science technology, because resilience has appeared as a major issue. We even have a recommendation from the governor about water resilience in general and groundwater resilience in particular. So we hope to uh, to have that, uh, not we hope, we are planning that uh, workshop. But for 2020, it was decided with the assistance of the Department of Water Resources of California, which is directly interested in whatever we do, because it helps them, even if it comes from the academic side, yet an academic rather practical for once, which is not always the case. We try to be as practical as possible. In any case, it was decided to have a survey during 2020 of the major stakeholders, water stakeholders, and namely groundwater stakeholders of California. We uh, we drafted and adopted a questionnaire to all the people corresponding with it. So most people using water in California, that the department has their addresses. And uh, on the answers, and we also organized interviews. Uh, Zoom was very practical. They were, of course, online interviews, but we had several interviews of very representative stakeholders representing, for instance, uh, the wine industry, representing agriculture and dairy products, uh, representing the general public, also and also representing cities. What what is urban water? So we have various, and we are now analyzing. I have some assistant at the university, PhD students helping for the analysis of that uh, of the results, and we are getting very interesting, very interesting uh, uh, information about what we still have to do. When I say we, it's not me or, or even my academic uh, colleagues, we mean the, 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 the water professionals, the Department of Water Resources, essentially, and all the people who compose the GSA, the Groundwater Sustainability, Sustainability Agencies, what they have to do. And the major aspect that appeared from our survey and interviewed 
is people are concerned with conflict, conflict resolution, because you have a multiplication through the GSA of uh, uh, institutions all of a sudden, which may conflict one with the other. Some don't, some do. You have also conflict between users. Agriculture may pump too much, for instance, just an example. And uh, or uh, let's say the use of groundwater is not really adequate. I personally traveled to Bakersfield to the central part of uh, California to see how irrigation was done, just to see, take photos as a private person, not even representing anybody, just by interest. And uh, I have to say, but it's my my view not an official view that I think that irrigation was not as efficient as it could be. I noticed a lot of evaporation, for instance, pumping groundwater and then letting go in canals or whatever to for irrigation. Okay, so in any case, there may be conflict between various users. Sigma is a big plus, for sure. But yet, even Sigma, in it, it is in theory a very good decision to to have taken that decision to have a, a for the first time a, a regulation legislation on groundwater in California. But yet, there are some negative issues that were uh, emphasized by the interviewees and by those people who answered the questionnaire, like a chronic lowering of groundwater levels in some areas with a reduced groundwater storage, seawater intrusion also, and of course, because of the connection between surface water and groundwater, some depletion of surface water. And then immediately conflict with surface water districts. You see, so, so there are some aspects in SEGMA that have to be taken care of. Other aspects in California which, are, uh, which have to be uh, considered the problem, of course, of economy and budget. Because money, you have to have money, especially because infrastructure may, uh, may be needed, new infrastructures. Especially uh, for irrigation. Especially for irrigation, but also used water treatment and recharge in groundwater. There are several areas where we went, where we also went physically. I traveled when it was, it is possible, we can travel uh, anywhere, as you know, mm -hmm. but uh, traveled and also by Zoom, uh, of course, with the people there, uh, where you have, uh, where they want to build uh, wastewater treatment plants and use that uh, treated uh, wastewater to recharge the groundwater. Are you talking about managed aquifer recharge then, Mar? This is managed aquifer recharge, I know, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. So, but this cost money, this is what I wanted to emphasize, not the technical aspect, but the cost. So we have to be sure, for instance, that hydrogeologically it is justified to have such a treatment plant. It is kind of fashion. You, you build a fashion uh, treatment plant because it's it has been useful, it is very useful, but we have to be sure that because of money, that it is really a plus, that it is needed. And sometimes we I had during the, the exchanges, people were complaining that they noticed that some infrastructure were built, but for instance, 
the groundwater level was not permanently decreasing. It was decreasing when there was high pumping, but then coming back. So they, they thought, why should we build a treatment plant? We have enough groundwater through the natural cycle, hydro cycle. So this is just an example of what I uh, came uh, across during the survey and the interviews. So it is really interesting for mm -hmm. a theoretician like me to be in contact with people in the field. Well, with real I, problems. At my age, I learn a lot through that work. And it's, it's really rewarding, at least for me. I, I, I learned something. So, the, the, so this is uh, what uh, I've seen with, uh, with California. Uh, I think that uh, you, you were interested, we can come back if you want. Uh, I think I talked about infrastructure, economy and budget and, uh, and conflict resolution. Uh, conflict resolution is really an important aspect that can be solved. This is what I wish to say. How? And you've spent the it's last like, couple of decades focusing on conflict resolution for water. But first, you have also we have to to teach the people how to solve that. And this was the UNESCO program was very successful in that. And my colleague and friend Lena Salame was is extremely successful in that organizing. She two years ago organizing organized courses in San Diego. Uh, I think that conflict resolution is a possibility. Is really a possibility if you go through training and uh, I would say uh, continuous training. That is not, a, not basic education, but you take young professionals and you train them. This is what we successfully did in 2019 during our meeting we had with that role play. And people were enthusiastic. They say they discovered ways of understanding the others. So you give them the skills then? To open their minds to other mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to other perspectives. Them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, as you know, uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work on governing the commons grew out of her work on groundwater in California. And uh, so do you find any inspiration in her work or not? It grew out of her work, um, I think it was her PhD work in groundwater um, but, uh, in California. No? No, no, a long time ago, no? Oh, yeah, yeah, long time ago. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. Uh, Yes, no, I, I I just know of her, and uh, I've been working for other yes with some uh, a colleague, but uh, it was ten years ago, something like that. So I yeah. no, I I find my inspiration, I would say, directly with the people in the field, not again another theoretician working in his or her. Uh, study uh, or at the university. No, I, I see with people when I t when I talk with the representative of the wine uh, group, when I talk with the people of the dairies and uh, people of agriculture, when I talk with people from the public works of the city. This is where I think my inspiration comes from for the, from their own. Uh, comments, their own conclusions, and whatever they try to do to solve their problems by themselves. Mm -hmm. And then we can come in, help, and, and get together, help together. And this comes to another aspect that I know from previous talks with you, you were interested. Uh, I would say the, the balance between policy and science which is a very important uh, aspect of my work, especially more recently. 
uh, as I told you, I have a personal experience of science and policy exchanges through my work at the European Union, at the European Commission. I work at the European Commission for 20 years, so I uh, have uh, drafting directives. Um, I mentioned groundwater, but there was also nitrate, wastewater. So, and I worked with lawyers and poli political people, of course. And so there you, because I worked on the scientific background of the laws. So there you learn how to exchange, how to understand the language of the other. Language and reasoning of the other people are very important. We scientists, we, we have a way of uh, reasoning which is not the ways of a lawyer. You know that. You are mm -hmm. a lawyer yourself, of a lawyer which does not mean that it is better or worse. It is different. And I just give an, an example. For a scientist, let's take what I've been working on, maximal admissible, uh, admissible, maximal admissible concentrations on pollutants. For instance, when we talk of nitrates, uh, NO3 uh, nitrate, 50 part per million, 50 ppm is a maximal admissible concentration. And for a scientist, if you are at 51, when you make your measurement, it's okay. 51, it's not 10%. Mm. You have a margin of error that you admit. The scientist is not rigorous in that sense. The scientist admits, she or he admits a margin of error. But if you go with a lawyer, the lawyer, when he sees or she sees 51, say, okay, we go to court. Cannot admit. So you, there is that difference. Mm. And you have to understand each other on that. This is just to illustrate the, the difference. And so what we need is that the politician and the lawyer understand the scientist, certainly, but conversely also, which is less frequent, the scientist has to understand what are the constraints of the lawyer and of the political person. Because very often, I've seen this with many colleagues and myself, by the way, when I directed an, an institute in France and I was looking for money, I could not understand why uh, when I went to see uh, our representative uh, there and uh, asking for a budget, he said, no, I cannot now. I said, that is most important what we are doing. No. We cannot, and so I say he does not understand anything in science. No, no, he had constraints. They, they had constraints. They could not deliver the money like we wanted. So we have to understand the political constraints and, uh, and also that the political people have to solve conflicts also or to take care of conflicts between various interests and cannot be fully with a scientific mind, as a different mind. So that is. But in any case, it is clear for me that governance should be based on sound science, for instance. It's important. Sound science yeah. is the basis. Otherwise, it doesn't work. No, otherwise, the science is the basis of policy, but we have to understand the constraints. Mm -hmm. of that. So, this is what I, I wanted to say or, or also. I wish also to uh, understand, to make people understand that uh, 
multidisciplinarity is very important in the domain of water. Water is the best example, according to what I know, of multidisciplinarity. We need people of various disciplines to work on the water problem. You, you water need, cuts uh, across a lot of different disciplines. Yes. And sectors. It, and, yeah. Exactly. We various disciplines and uh, for instance the, 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 the what they call the pure scientist which doesn't mean much but it is a tradition the pure scientist that is the mathematician or the physicist etc by maybe by some kind of snobbish uh, attitude does not want to understand anything on social sciences and yet social sciences he doesn't even want to call them sciences, social, whatever, are important. You have to understand what the people are, how they behave, how they react, what is their concern, etc. So, I don't say psychiatrist, but at least social scientists are necessary, are needed. We have to be, we don't, we don't have to exaggerate also on the other side, but social scientists, uh, lawyers, uh, geographers, historians. I personally have worked on with historians <coughs> and uh, on aspect of climate change. When I worked in uh, on the RLC, I, I, I worked two years for two, well, uh, in 96, 1996, and then in 1998 in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. One of the uh, tragedies of, wa of the water world is the RLC. Yeah, but uh, on the RLC and uh, the disaster of the RLC. And I worked with historians and with books of history, not only with scientists, to understand that although many political people for pure political reasons were saying that the RLC disaster is man-made, I show and I was reporting for the European Commission, so I was on an official business there, I show that no, men is certainly aggravating the situation, especially now, but that situation exists without even the influence of men and existed, for instance, in the Middle Ages. And I worked no with Yes. Huh. In the Middle Ages, the two main rivers uh, of the uh, going to the RLC were going directly to the Caspian and then came back to the RLC the Amudaya and the Siadaya. Interesting. Yeah, it was a discovery. And uh, a friend of mine who was ambassador of Uzbekistan in Paris asked me if I could delay, I could change my report to the European Commission because they were negotiating with the Russians uh, compensations. Mm. Because mm. Russians were, uh, it was the Soviet Union before, so Russians were responsible or inherited the responsibility, let's say. I told him uh, it's a strange uh, demand, uh, but I cannot, but I can just, just uh, give you time to react. That's all. And uh, that, okay, he, he managed to react correctly and, and they but uh, they were bothered by such uh, reality, you see. Mm -hmm. So it, I was just speaking of multidisciplinarity, history, mm -hmm. geography, of course. And this I had used uh, uh, a very well-known French geographer, Élisée Reclus, 
who wrote, and I have uh, the original copy of his geography of 1873. I'm collecting old books. So it happened that I have an original copy of 18 dating from 1873 of Elysee Reclus, where I read that uh, the Caspian, the, the Aral Sea was of almost disappeared during the, some part of the Middle Ages. So. And that's how you discovered that it can happen under natural conditions. Yes. This is what I wanted to say. Uh, yes. Okay. We could talk for a very long time. Um, two things I wanted to ask you about. Uh, one is um, IWRA and the other is what advice you would give to young people. So can we talk about those yes. now? Um, yes. When did you become involved with IWRA? It was early in your career. You were, you were one of the original people uh, with IWRA. Yes. Uh, uh, for the advice for young people, first, I think that it is important to know and understand the role of water in society through a good knowledge of history, culture, uh, political sciences and social sciences, and including religion also because in religion it has a, a, a great significance also. I just can illustrate that, uh, that I worked uh, during my career in some Muslim countries, and I had a big problem with the economy of water and the cost of water, because uh, some of the farmers with whom I had uh, exchanges were telling me, we cannot pay anything for water. We don't want to pay anything for water because it's a gift of Allah. I said, yes, but with the help of engineers and economists from their country, we managed to prove and to show them, and they accepted, that they were not paying for the water. They were paying for the all the for the transport of water for the treatment uh, for the treatment for everything around water but not for the quantity itself not for the water itself and that worked quite well so religion has an significant the role of water in the economy of a country it's very important of course because many uh, sec uh, economic sectors depend on water. You mentioned agriculture, agriculture and all related uh, subjects, and including water prices. So the role of water in the economy, uh, economy of a country is very important. And also with support of knowledge and science, this is I would say a major recommendation to insist on policy and governance. Policy and governance to be open to social sciences and conflict resolution. And of course, as I said, multidisciplinarity, but really policy and governance. And that goes also for IVRA, because we can, through the International Water Resources Association, we can show what is really uh, policy, water policy. We can have meetings on that. We can have round tables uh, that we can have, uh, especially with the Zoom or with all other video uh, devices, we can rather easily do that. And policy and governance. And of course, the development of new technologies. You should not forget with the social scientists that water relies on technology, especially the, the new technology, including ICTs, of course, but uh, to increase the availability of freshwater resources and also demand management. 
As you know, IWRA prides itself on being a place where scientists and policymakers meet and exchange ideas. Um, and so I'm very happy to hear you say that. And is that what drew you to IWRA many years ago? Because you were one of the, the people who was involved at the very, very beginning. As you know, we are about to celebrate our 50th anniversary. Yes, I know. I was involved. I, I, I think I wrote you, I told you through the one of the founders, the Professor Vente Chao, who was my advisor at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and what the person who brought me to, to groundwater, really, to, to water, I would say in general, because when I came to Illinois, uh, I was more involved in modeling in, in uh, partial differential equations than in water. And uh, so he, he, I was, I, through Bente Chow, I got involved in water, in groundwater. And when he founded, or helped, when he founded IBRA, I, I was one of the first members and uh, organized some meetings in Paris in 1975, uh, uh, for instance, in Paris and Strasbourg, where I was teaching. So uh, uh, I think that the role of Ivra is uh, fundamental in that aspect, to the connection between science and policy the connection between people. Also, maybe we, Ibra could uh, invite uh, people representing not necessarily a science, but the, the users. Mm. If we could have some the, the users, meaning representative of various economic sectors, Mm. That could That's be a good. terrific idea. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And for instance, and urban dwellers, people who, like the person I interviewed, uh, represent who lives in a in a city and was telling about the problem of the problems of the city uh, inhabitants concerning water, and not only groundwater but water, especially in a period of drought in California, mm -hmm. where you are told all of a sudden that you have to restrict the use of water, that you have to shower only once a week, yeah. or things like that. It's, it's one thing to read about it, but it's another thing to hear from that person directly. No, the, the, we receive information that uh, you consume that much water, you have to to decrease the consumption of water, uh, try not to use the, uh, try not to flush the toilet too often or for any reason, well, things like that. Yeah, yeah. And um, you're right, it has a real impact on real people. And so it's good to have those voices at the table. That's a very yeah. good point. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think so, not only the specialist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm really the people who live because they have water, they need water. Mm -hmm. and, and not only in India or in Africa, where it's traditional to, have to say that the woman is part of the water service because uh, the, the woman goes to the well and comes back, etc. It's okay, it's very fancy, very nice to say it, it's very true. But also in our regions, we are facing problems. Mm -hmm. In our regions, we are facing problems, especially with the drought. And now look at the, the, the wildfires in, uh, yeah. in, in California. California. Yeah, all over the, the west of the United States. Yes, yeah. Oregon, uh, yeah. California. Washington, Washington, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it's a, it's a drought and water would be useful if we had plenty of it, but we don't. 
So we have to know how to manage it, to handle it. And IVRA can be very useful in that by bringing the right people together. Okay, that's a great idea. Thank you. And I want to thank you for making yourself available today and also for your long involvement, not only with IWRA, for which we are deeply grateful, but for your involvement with the water sector, because if anyone has made a difference, you certainly have, uh, not only with your personal interactions, but also with your wide publications. I, I lost count of how many papers and books you have written in your career. And so we are all blessed by your involvement in the water sector. Um, thank you so much for your time, Jean. I thank you very much, René, and really, I, I like. I hope I didn't talk too much because when I start talking, like my students say, uh, "Please, sir, stop a little. We have questions." <laughs> <laughs>